Stuart Gully, and I'm the president of Woodward Academy in Atlanta. I'm an ordained United Methodist minister. I worked at Emory University for about 10 years before I went to LaGrange College down in LaGrange, Georgia, a United Methodist related institution, as president from 1996 to 2009. And then in 2009, I made my move to uh, Woodward Academy. Uh, as a part of my journey, both in ministry and in education, I have come to understand and appreciate the importance of servanthood. And so I'm uh, grateful for an opportunity to have a chance to reflect with you some on uh, what we just heard from Ambassador Young and uh, some of the things that I think about as it relates to this topic. Particularly when you think about race relations or any challenging issue that we are confronted with in society, it is my opinion that the only thing that is going to help those matters be addressed in a meaningful and thoughtful way is through servanthood. Uh, at Woodward Academy, we have 2,700 students. We're a pre-K through 12th grade program. We were started in 1900 as Georgia Military Academy. And up until the mid-1960s, we were an all-white male institution preparing young men for service in one of the armed forces. But in the 1960s, military education began falling out of favor and the then president of Woodward realized that for the future of that institution, we needed to change course radically, abandon a military education in favor of college preparatory education. So we gave up our name, Georgia Military Academy, took the name of our founder, Colonel John Woodward. We became co-educational overnight, integrated a few years after that, and today we are one of the most diverse educational institutions, public or private, in the United States. 50% of our students are Caucasian, 28% are African American, 15% are Asian Indian, and the remaining would identify as either Hispanic, multiracial, or biracial. We believe that part of what we're trying to do at Woodward is create a microcosm of the world so that when challenges come along, our students will have encountered people who are different from themselves to be able to understand how to relate to someone who is different from them. At Woodward, we talk about practicing what Martha Nussbaum of the University of Chicago describes as narrative imagination. Being able to understand and experience the world through the lens of someone different from themselves. Now, we don't promote a theological foundation for that because we're a non-sectarian school, but certainly it is very theologically related for me. But to be able to uh, relate to someone who is different from ourselves doesn't have to have a theology behind it. It's just a matter of simple respect and appreciation for someone who is different. One of our most famous alums is Robert W. Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff graduated from what was then Georgia Military Academy in 1908. And he was the famous CEO of Coca-Cola during the middle part of the 20th century, building Coca-Cola into what it is today. He was Mr. Anonymous in Atlanta for donating major sums of money to a variety of nonprofits, helping to make the nonprofit sector in Atlanta as strong as it is. On our campus, we have a life-size statue of Mr. Woodruff holding his trademark cigar, and at the base of the statue is inscribed a statement that he was fond of saying, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't care who gets the credit. So much in society today, we are concerned about taking credit for something rather than not worrying about it and even allowing maybe someone to take credit for something that they shouldn't be taking credit for. He had a business philosophy that he practiced with the people at Coca-Cola and that he preached to them regularly. He said the five most important words in the English language are, I am proud of you. The four most important words in the English language he said are, what is your opinion? The three most important words, he said, are, if you please. The two most important words in the English language, he said, are, thank you. 
And he said, the least important word in the English language is I, the word I. And in that business philosophy is a wonderful description of what servanthood is all about. <clears throat> the most important words in the English language he identified were all focused on someone different from him. And the least important word where he was in a position to uh, promote himself and to brag about all the things that he had accomplished in life, he knew it wasn't going to bring him any glory and to deny the word I in the way that he relates to other people. When Dr. King received the Nobel Peace Prize, the business community in Atlanta did not want to celebrate that fact. But Mr. Woodruff stepped up to the plate. He contacted the then mayor of Atlanta and said, Coca-Cola will put up whatever it costs financially for the business community of Atlanta to celebrate him. And I pledge to you that I will be certain that the rest of the business community turns out to celebrate Dr. King and what he accomplished. And they did, after he received the Nobel Peace Prize, have a wonderful celebration of that accomplishment. But it was because of Mr. Woodruff's understanding of the importance of what Dr. King had accomplished that the rest of the white community in Atlanta and the business community in particular rallied around him. When we think about servanthood, we acknowledge that the most important person who was a servant was Jesus Christ. And there are many examples that you can give from Scripture that talk about that. But one that I think is uh, perhaps the most important is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 20 through 28. And I'll read them to you. The mother of Zebedee's sons then came before him with her sons. She bowed low and begged a favor. What is it you wish? asked Jesus. I want you, she said, to give orders that in your kingdom my two sons may sit next to you, one at your right and the other at your left. I'm going to stop here and as an aside say this is the first example of a helicopter parent in the Bible <laughs> that I have to deal with a lot in education and I know churches have to deal with a lot to, as well. Jesus turned to the brothers, brothers and said, you do not understand what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I am to drink? We can, they replied. Then he said to them, you shall indeed share my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. It is for those to whom it has already been assigned by my father. When the other ten heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. So Jesus called them to him and said, you know that in the world, rulers lord it over their subjects, and their great men make them feel the weight of authority. But it shall not be so with you. Among you, whoever wants to be great must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the willing slave of all. Like the Son of Man, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for many. Here Jesus has a clear understanding that his sole purpose on earth is to be a servant for others, to sacrifice himself, in, in fact his bodily existence, in order that our sinful nature might be overcome. In 1 Corinthians 13, when we think about the characteristics that are important for making up what it is to be a servant, verses 4 through 8 have pretty good examples of the characteristics of love. Love is patient and kind. Love envies no one, is never boastful, never conceited, never rude. Love is never selfish never quick to take offense. Love keeps no score of wrongs, takes no pleasure in the sins of others, but delights in the truth. There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. 
So I want to show you up here a model for servant hood that begins with the simple word will or choice. Ken Blanchard, the Christian business leader and writer, says that when we say that in life there are two things that are inevitable, death and taxes, we have that wrong. He said death is indeed inevitable. But he said the other thing, the only other thing inevitable in life is choice, making a decision, having the will to do something. He said that intentions plus actions equal will. Intentions minus actions, he said, equals squat. <laughs> you can have all the intentions in the world to the, do the most noble things imaginable, but if you don't act on them, you're not doing what is necessary to make a difference in the world. So to serve as Jesus served, to demonstrate love and those characteristics described in 1 Corinthians 13, it doesn't come naturally for us because we are all fallen. We are all given the condition of original sin. It is much more our nature to be selfish than to be selfless. And so it takes an act of will on our part in order to love, to practice love and servanthood. So the characteristics of love that we heard expressed in 1 Corinthians 13 are articulated on this page here. Things like patience, demonstrating self-control, kindness, showing appreciation or encouragement for someone else, humility, not being arrogant or boastful, respectfulness, treating others as important, being selfless, putting ahead of ourselves the needs of others. And I'm a member of the uh, Rotary Club, and one of the things that we talk about is service above self as an example of servanthood. Forgiveness, giving up resentment. Dr. King famously said on this topic that if we always insist on an eye and an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'll eventually become a society that is blind and toothless. So that for forgiveness is a part of the Christian human nature and our makeup. That we should practice honesty. We need to be free from self-deception. And that we need to practice commitment. That once we have committed ourselves to certain goals and objectives in our lives, that we not change those, but that we live them out. Car uh, Stephen Carter, who teaches at Harvard a law school, wrote a book a little over a decade ago titled uh, The Manners, Morals, and Etiquette of Democracy. And it was a treatise on the word civility. And he said that in practicing civility, or if you could wanted to substitute the word servanthood there, it requires that we see in the other individual God's image. That we practice an attitude of awe, and respect and gratitude for the person who is different from us. But the only way that we will be a civil society is when we judge the other as a child of God. And Ambassador Young gave us a great example of that when he talked about his wife, Jean, and in referring to the people who were of the KKK. When, he, when she said to him that if you don't believe that that person underneath that cloak is also a child of God that you need to stop preaching. So often we tend to stereotype individuals in our relationship with them or a collection of individuals because of some bias or prejudice that we have against them. And when we do that, we are denying ourselves the opportunity to serve them and for them to be served by us. David Brooks recently wrote a book on character. He is an opinion editorial writer for the New York Times and also a commentator on PBS. And he describes these traits of love as eulogy virtues. 
Okay, when we think at the end of the day, what is it that we want to be known for? It's in how we have practiced these character traits of love, these eulogy virtues in our life, versus what he describes as resume virtues, where we are so absorbed in ourselves and how we're promoting ourselves that we are finding ways to advance our own agenda in life versus being concerned for someone different from ourselves. If you're a clergy person, you will know that Bishop Sue has uh, asked all of the clergy over the course of the next uh, few weeks to read these two books. One book is Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When the Stakes Are High, and the other book is The Anatomy of Peace. Resolving the Heart of Conflict. She's hosting two days apart in the month of April where she has asked all of the clergy of the North Georgia Conference to come together and with her to reflect on the content of these books. Primarily in preparation for the recommendation that the Council of Bishops will be making this summer on how we respond as a denomination to the tensions that exist in our church over sexual orientation. What will our official statement eventually end up being? And how will we be represented as a church once we've determined what our official statement is going to be? The Council of Bishops will be making their recommendation based on a task force called the Way Forward Commission that's been working over the last several years on this topic. And the bishop, uh, council of bishops will be making their recommendation, and there will be a called general conference in early 2019 where a decision will be made on this matter. And so Bishop Sue rightly is trying to prepare the clergy who are leading their congregations and trying to imagine how we address a topic of such controversy and challenge both for us potentially individually, but also for our churches and how we lead them through that conflict. And in these books is a description of what it means to be a servant. Crucial Conversations is a description largely of, on a how-to basis of how you engage a person in a challenging conversation. To me, the more interesting of the two books is The Anatomy of Peace, where this is a description of a group of parents who have gone to a camp because their children have all been in some stage of challenge or crisis in their life. And they are now needing to go out into the wilderness to live and to grow. But one of the things the book cites is that the issue that the children are dealing with is not just their own issue. Any family has its own dynamics and makeup. And so much of the issues that the children are dealing with is what's going on with the parent. And so this book goes through a 42-hour period of the parents learning about how they can understand their role and how their children have gotten to where they are now and what they can do to help them become more whole and healing people. And in The Anatomy of Peace, it describes that we are called as an individual to practice our heart at peace in our relationship to another person or to a group of people. And that if we can say that our heart is at peace, that we want to serve and love someone else, we then have a choice to make. Remember what I said about will. This is the, the choice place. And so when we act on will, we've got one of two choices that we make in our relationship to someone else. The first is, is that we can honor the sense of peace, not just in ourselves, but in the person or group of persons that we are working with. But that's the more challenging choice to make. The more likely choice we make, because of our fallen nature, is that we betray the sense of being at peace in our heart. And so we are then treating the other individual or the group as an object. And we're acting out of a sense of a heart not at peace, but a heart at war. And the heart is at war because it's trying to accomplish things that will help the self. 
there are four kind of attitudes, and I apologize for my handwriting. I'm a terrible handwriting here. Um, but there are typically four attitudes that the anatomy of peace says that we practice. One is, is that we think of ourselves as better than the other individual uh, or the group. Or that I deserve, because of something significant that I have done in my life, I deserve to be treated the way that I'm expecting others to treat me. Or if not a better than, sometimes it's a worse than. We don't feel like we measure up, and therefore we retreat. And finally, uh, there is the sense that sometimes we need to be seen as someone who has accomplished something significant. And that we're acting out of these four stories when we betray the sense of our heart being at peace. In the Crucial Conversations book, it talks about that when we are in relationship with someone else, we need to be mindful of what is it that we want to get out of the relationship, what do we want the other person to get out of the relationship, and how can we work together for the mutual ends of what we are trying to accomplish. The, um, uh, but, but one of the responses that we can make when we're engaged in conflict with someone, if our heart isn't at peace, is that we either retreat or practice, in this book they say violence, rather than... <laughs> but in all, both of these books, and in the description I gave to you earlier, to practice servanthood depends upon us making a conscious decision to do it. And one of the ways that we develop our mind and our heart to be able to do it is by practicing those acts of piety that we are called to practice, like Bible study, fasting, praying. Uh, several weeks ago, I was dealing with the most challenging discipline matter I had had to address at Woodward in my nine years there. It was an episode between two students. It involved law enforcement, forensics experts, and attorneys. The resolution of the matter took over a week to get all of the evidence that was necessary and uh, to reach a conclusion. The offending student and the offending student's family claimed that the student didn't know what the student was doing at the time, and it was an innocent mistake. The victim in this felt extremely violated, and the parents were adamant that strong and swift action had to be taken against the student and the parents because it was viewed that the parents were in collusion with the student for the action that had been taken against the other child. It happened that I was close to one of the families and had never imagined that I would have to be in a kind of conversation with someone I knew so well over something that was so challenging and conflict-ridden. And I guess it was a gift that God gave me that I was reading this book, um, The Anatomy of Peace at Time, uh, because it caused me to think about, in my prayer life, how was I practicing being a heart at peace in my dealings with all of these people? with all the very folks that I was having to address. The decision I ultimately would make would end up resulting in the expulsion of one of the offending student. But could I do it in a way that would do it with dignity and respect to the student and the family? Now, in the past, I've not usually had to get to the point of having to expel students because when the situation has been so challenging or difficult, the family generally chooses to withdraw the child. But in this instance, they chose not to do that, thinking that in my review of the matter and other administrators, that we would come to a conclusion that supported their decision. Now, in the end, by prayer and trying consciously to always keep my heart at peace and centered and focused, I feel like I managed that situation as thoughtfully and meaningfully as I could. And I hope that in some way uh, that I was representing to the family that I knew best in this situation uh, the, the spirit of Christ to them. One of the more dramatic experiences I have had of this experience of servanthood was at my uh, time at LaGrange College when I was president there. 
One of the things that we talked about a lot at the Grange was practicing servant leadership and the need to practice narrative imagination, as I described for you earlier, and to be mindful of our heart and our attitude and how we approach and work with others. We developed as our motto while I was there, challenging the mind and inspiring the soul. You couldn't go anywhere on campus while I was there and not know that that was our motto. And students could even recite it for you. Well, in 2004, uh, at our baccalaureate service, we had the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss as our baccalaureate speaker. It happened to be the 50th anniversary of the uh, Board of Education versus uh, the Brown versus the T Topeka Board of Education decision that outlawed segregated education. Otis Moss grew up in the Grange, Georgia. He went on to greatness by attending Morehouse College, serving then as the senior pastor of the Mount Olivet Institutional Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. He was then the chairman of the board at Morehouse College and uh, was very close to a number of uh, major leaders in the Atlanta community. In fact, he gave the eulogy when Maynard Jackson died. So uh, Bishop, uh, Dr. Moss comes and he uh, delivers a baccalaureate address, the title of which is Roses Blooming in Desert Places. Hmm. And he talks about the example of Dr. Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa, his examples of how they had uh, bloomed in the desert places where they had grown up. He shared with us throughout his sermon about the challenges of growing up in the deeply segregated community of LaGrange in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. He said, I would often imagine what was up on that hill where LaGrange College is when I would drive down uh, Vernon Street, but I was not allowed by law or by custom to come on your campus. He said, in fact, the only time I was allowed on your campus was one summer when you needed the windows washed in your Smith Hall, and I was allowed to come up here and get 10 cents an hour and to clean the windows of Smith Hall under very unsafe conditions. While he never made it explicit, we knew that in his presentation that he was demonstrating for us an example of a rose that had bloomed in the desert place of LaGrange, Georgia. Well, after the, he preached, our gospel choir sang a song, and then we had a handful of students who practice a, a Seventh-day Adventist-type uh, religion, all of whom were African-American, who, because of their religion, would not be able to participate in graduation the next morning, which would be Saturday morning, because they observed Saturday as the Sabbath. So we had had a practice previously of allowing these students to receive their diplomas at the baccalaureate service. And so we called these students forth, gave them their diplomas. They received a standing ovation from everyone who was there. When it was all over, it was for me one of the most meaningful baccalaureate services I had ever attended. That evening, my wife and I hosted a dinner for some of the dignitaries who were going to be participating in graduation the next day. And that night, as we went home, I went to check our phone and I had a voicemail message. And the voicemail message was from a very uh, agitated, uh, white-sounding white gentleman who said, that baccalaureate service tonight was nothing but a meeting of the NAACP. We certainly expect that tomorrow's commencement ceremony won't be a repeat of that. And he hung up. Didn't identify himself. Didn't say who his child was. I uh, was just, you could have given me a physical punch that I could have tolerated better than the, the punch to the gut that I felt like I took just in hearing those words from someone who experienced that service entirely differently from the way that I did. Well, I, I was slightly worried about security graduation the next day, but I elected not to tell anyone about the experience for fear of getting folks riled up and just not wanting to disrupt graduation. We had graduation the next morning. It was a beautiful day. It went off without a hitch. And that afternoon, as I went home, I went and checked the phone, and there was another voicemail message, this time from a young girl who said, President Gully, I know that my father called you yesterday and said some harsh things. 
and I want you to know that I apologize and that I did not experience the service that way. I thank you that LaGrange College challenged my mind and inspired my soul. And she hung up. And to this day, I still don't know who that student is or who her father is. But I'm grateful that the commitment that LaGrange College had and still has to this day and to all of our institutions that to practice servanthood and to demonstrate it, to be an environment and a community that is intentional on trying to reach out to the other, to put aside our own needs and wants in order to serve the needs and wants of someone else is what is going to make us great. So when we think about this landscape of racism in our world today, of the issues that are confronting our church, it's got to begin with an attitude of servanthood on our part and openness to being able to hear and learn from someone who is different from ourselves. So thank you for hearing my remarks. I've got a few minutes uh, remaining here, and I would welcome you to ask a question or comment. If not about this, anything that you've heard uh, that resonated with you from Ambassador Young that you'd like to lift up. Yes. There seems to be uh, servant leadership is kind of the flavor of the times. Um, it's become very popular. Um, has it, uh, have you seen in, in your research and such that the great leaders of all times have had that attitude, even though it may have been uh, an oddity or, or not certainly not promoted uh, as the secret to success. Um, yeah. you know, is, is that fairly <coughs> universal, or uh, are there a lot of people who have made it uh, long term the other way? Yeah. I think you know, if you think about Jim Collins, the book that he has written, Good to Great, and he talks about the people who are really great leaders. He doesn't use any theological language to talk about what is greatness, and nor do these. Uh, the, the, there's, there's not a, a, a mention of God anywhere. But it is, I think, um, a demonstration in Jim Collins' case that to be a level five leader is a person who is greatly self-aware who doesn't need to impose self on someone else and who recognizes that the greatness of their leadership or the work of their company is going to come from serving others well and best. Uh, Max Dupree, who used to be the CEO of the Herman Miller Company, uh, once said that the first job of the leader is to define reality. The last job of the leader, he said, is to say thank you. And he said, in between the job of the leader is to serve. Uh, so even if you uh, say, you know, I, I guess it's uh, maybe a debate, but maybe not much of one, that Abraham Lincoln was probably the greatest president in the United States uh, history. Not a particularly religious individual, but the, the level of sacrifice that he made and the commitment to serving others and to taking on a very challenging uh, issue when it was related to slavery and, and racism, uh, I think demonstrated even then the value of being a servant leader. Yes? Uh, in the students you serve, what do you, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to young people adapting a servant kind of attitude? What, what stands in their what is the biggest obstacle to people uh, becoming uh, more servant-oriented? Um, this right here, technology, <laughs> is probably the greatest thing. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion going on right now that uh, we are, are uh, raising a generation of young people who don't know how to relate to others. They are so absorbed with the technology and relating through the technology that when they especially go off to college and they're having to share a room with someone or be in a, a, a committee with someone, they don't know how to do it. Uh, and they have a real sense of aloneness uh, and are not really sure how they can find their way. Uh, so I think one of the things that we try to preach at uh, Woodward is that you can't live your life on technology. 
And uh, we actually incorporate into our curriculum a requirement that they have to have so many service hours in order to graduate. So we are intentionally placing them in settings where they can see the need that exists around them. Some of these students coming from extremely wealthy families and recognizing the blessings that are theirs and what is required of them to give back and to make a difference. Uh, so if I allow myself to stay awake at night and worry about the greatest challenge, I think it's the technology that's the thing that gets in the way most for them. Offer, uh, it just we have five minutes left, I'd just be here a, a word or a sentence or a comment about how you resonated with Ambassador Young. What's something that stood out to you? Let's quit talking about blacks and whites, mm -hmm. but let's talk about the cause which is poverty. Poverty, yeah. Overall. Yeah, that resonated with me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really thought of it in that way. Right. Yeah. And also that we are asked us to, again, like she said, stop talking about race, but also recognize and understand that we are all a child of God. Thank you, Mike. Other observations? He was very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> he did do a good job of uh, being diplomatic, you're right. Well, at 86 years of age, I want to be able to sit up on a stage somewhere and just be able to talk uh, off the top of my head and be as uh, powerful and consequential in my remarks as he was for me. You know, he does that on TV. There's a program. It comes on, I, I guess it's still on. It's, it's sort of like he's just doing the same thing. Right. They're like sort of interviewing him. Um, I don't know if it's on oh, it's on the weekend, like Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. or something. Saturday. I've not seen that, so I'll have to check that out, yeah. You could not help but not listen to him. I mean, it was interesting. You, you, you come here and think, I'm going to go listen to Andrew Young, okay? Right. You know, this is going to be awesome. But then when he starts talking, you just can't help but right. not listen to him. Right. You just, you're just listening. That's right. And part of it is the compelling way he speaks, but part of it also is, is that he has practiced <coughs> will and loving and serving and sacrificing, and out of that is a kind of authority that he has developed that we are so awed by what he has accomplished that he is owed the opportunity to, to speak and for us to listen and to get three standing ovations in an hour. Um, yeah. Yes, Ron? So uh, you said population at Woodward, um, you know, great diversity, and we're talking about ripple effect today. And I often think about it's going to begin with the kids. And, you know, when, when they're in a diverse environment at school, I'm wondering if you went to 10 birthday parties of, you know, just randomly pick 10, would they be as diverse as your school is? And are all the families, um, happy about that. I mean, are, are they at Woodward because they're getting the most fantastic education they can? Or are they there for the diversity? Are things changing because of the diversity at Woodward? Well, uh, I'd like to think it's both, the great education uh, as well as the diversity. One of the things that we talk about at Woodward is that we practice a deep respect for difference. And we are unapologetic about that. And we expect that it be practiced by every member of the community. So it is not uncommon that if you were to go to an off-campus setting, a birthday party, an overnight stay, that it will be racially mixed. Uh, the, the, the number of uh, uh, friends that my sons have who are non-Caucasian, persons of color, is just amazing to me. I often tell the story, we, when we left LaGrange, we might have known one Jewish family in LaGrange. And our oldest son started at Woodward in seventh grade. And in the fall semester, he was invited to four bar and bat mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and Woodward's got a, a large Jewish population, uh, as well as a Muslim and Hindu population uh, as well. So uh, I, I do think we often hear a lot of Caucasian families particularly say the reason they send their children to Woodward is that they don't want them raised in what they call the buckhead bubble. That they want their children to realize that there's more to 
an education than just being with people who are like themselves. But you know, there also are a lot of families that are diverse. In my family alone, um, there's white, there's um, Mexican, all in the family. So all of our birthdays and mm -hmm. Christmases and and there's a lot of families like that, so it's, right. it's like growing. It's a great gift to it have is. that level, level of diversity. And it's really even better when you can laugh and joke and have a good time Absolutely. instead of there being tension. Right. Like, you know, in the beginning when you don't really know everybody or why are they bringing them into our family. It's not like that anymore. Yeah. You're just happy that your child is happy. And, exactly. And it grows from there. Exactly. And she also has. We need to come share a meal with you. <laughs> are there students, are there uh, lower income students on scholarship at Woodward? There are some. I, you know, if I have any sadness about our level of diversity, it, it's least in socioeconomic diversity. But we do make money available for students who have demonstrated financial need, uh, but we, we never have enough money for the, the number of students who want to attend. Yes, ma'am. You're an educator. I'm assuming there's some other ones in the room. But I've been hearing that when you go into, let's say, a high school and it's lunchtime, you don't see the diversity in the public schools that you might be seeing in Woodward. I'm wondering, do you and, and do others agree? Uh, are you suggesting that people are sitting at the same table with the people of their own makeup and race? There, there is, yes, I, I think there is evidence that self-segregation is kind of taking place uh, uh, in some settings. But I, I don't know that I would necessarily say that that should be judged as failure. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I have come to appreciate from a place of privilege as a white person is that to not be in a privileged place, that it sometimes helps to be in a setting, even if it's for a brief period of time, with people who are like you, so you can sort of decompress. Uh, and I think that's part of what is happening when uh, uh, people are uh, together. Beverly Tatum, who is the former president of Spelman College, wrote a book that she's just updated that is titled, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together at the Lunch Table? And uh, one of the points that she makes is precisely that, that, um, that in a minority, uh, to be in the minority, in a majority culture, you need a place from time to time where you can, can decompress. And that may be some of what is happening. What do you see um, the church's role in doing any, some of the, bringing the, them together in the schools? Anything? Well, I think to talk about it, and you know, maybe, uh, you know, they, one of the complaints or con, uh, uh, comments about uh, uh, the church and Christendom is at the most segregated place uh, at 11 o'clock on Sundays are our churches. Uh, and so what can maybe we do as churches that are uh, perhaps not very diverse consciously to engage uh, other congregations or other individuals who are different from <coughs> ourselves to allow us to grow? I have to stop saying that we've never done it that way before. Yeah, you'll have to stop saying we've never done it that way before. That is true. Yeah. Well, I know we are beyond our time. I would like to close with uh, the prayer of St. Francis, if you will allow me, that I think, to me at least, speaks uh, to the uh, importance of servanthood. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen.